Okay, moving along with the mixed models, I'm going to talk about the two-stage summary statistics, statistics approach today, which is a type of shortcut that we use for our imaging data. So what I want you to get from this is that we aren't applying exactly a mixed model uh, as uh, that would match, say, LMER and R, but it is a close approximation. Make sure you're ready. I'm building off the hair example, so please revisit the mixed model motivation hair example video prior to this if you haven't already watched it. If you have watched it and you just need a refresher, recall the hair example was an example where we had multiple subjects, uh, males and females, and multiple hairs per subject. And we, the motivation there was that you have both within and between subject variability. That's what the mixed model is all about. The within subject variability is the fact that our hairs on our head all have different lengths due to our haircuts. So there's within subject variability. And between subject variability is because we have different haircuts. So our hair lengths will be different from subject to subject. So for this illustration, I'm gonna focus just on females. Uh, three females, and I'm assuming I have 20 hairs per person, and we're going to look at the actual models we would use to estimate the overall mean hair length and its variance. A fixed effects model would look like this. So I have 60 observations here. It's the 60 hair lengths for uh, the 20 hairs for each of my three ladies. And I have a column of ones that I'm using in my design matrix. This is a one sample t-test, so beta g is my fixed effect. It's the overall mean hair length. And I just have a single variance, which I'm calling sigma squared win for within. That's the fixed effects model. So here is the mixed effects model. So it has two stages. In the first stage, you can see the model is a one-way ANOVA with three levels. I am using a cell means approach. So I have an indicator for each female. So beta 1 is the mean hair length for female 1, beta 2 is the mean hair length for female 2, and then beta 3 is the mean hair length for the third female. And for now I'm assuming the within subject variance of so the variability of hair length is the same for all women. This in reality is relaxed in each woman will be allowed to have her own variance, but for now we're going to assume for simplicity it is the same. The second stage gives us what we actually wanted. We want the group hair length. So this is a one sample t-test. We're averaging over, notice these betas do not have hats on them. These are the true unknown hair lengths for each of our three ladies. Averaging it together and then here we have a between subject variance. So this is the variance in hair length due to the different haircuts. Now you might notice we have a beta in two places, beta here and beta here. So let's just do a little algebra. And that's a random effect, by the way. Let's do a little algebra and just plug stage two into stage one. So I'm gonna replace this beta up here with this big expression right here. Okay, let me stare at it a little. So we're gonna end up with X times all of this. And that's the all-in-one mixed effects model. We have X times XG beta G. So we're back to the thing that looked like our original fixed effects model. But the fancy part is that we have these two variance terms. This X eta, this is our random effect. And then we have the between subject variance component. And then here is our within subject variance component. So this is the all-in-one mixed effects model, and this is what uh, traditional mixed effects software, such as LMER and R, it, it uses an iterative approach where it basically estimates beta G, and it goes back and it estimates these variance terms, and then it goes back and it re-estimates beta G, and then it updates these variance estimates back and forth, back and forth. Um, I'm not gonna get into that, but that is the proper mixed model. Um, so let's see what this looks like with fMRI data. So our repeated measures here, instead of it being hairs on a head, it's time points in an fMRI run. So I have a, time, a collection of data points that's organized in a time series. So, um, right. So the random subject effect is necessary so that we can apply our inference to the entire population, not just our population of subjects for which we have data. 
So of course, as we've seen, especially in all the steps we had to go through for the level one models, fMRI data are far more complicated than the hair length data. Um, we're not just typically estimating a simple intercept. We have some convolved regressor for our, our expected bold response that we're modeling. Uh, the time series, as we saw, are temporally autocorrelated. They're pretty long. Um, so let's just look at the, what the model would look like, the all-in-one model with two stimuli. So basically, each of these little things is the design matrix for faces, houses, for each subject. And you stack that those on top of each other. And then you have this thing. Uh, we have two between subject variances, one for faces, one for houses. We have the within subject variance. We have the within subject temporal autocorrelation estimate. So this is rather involved. And to go at this in one swoop and try to estimate this temporal autocorrelation, that's this within, within, within subject variance. Again, these are for each subject and these other two variance components and these two betas, it is possible, yes, but it's messy and inconvenient. So it's computationally intensive, but probably in this day and age, that's a poor excuse, but probably the primary motivation is what if we add another subject? Then we have to estimate this whole thing all over again, and that's a pain. So instead, we're gonna go back to our two-stage summary statistics approach. So before we plugged stage two into stage one, but now instead of doing that, we're going to keep them separate. So not only that, we're gonna, we're gonna change up stage one a little bit. So before we estimated these betas all at once, but let's just do it separately. There's no need to um, put all the ladies into the same model. Let's just estimate their average hair length within each person. I'm still assuming this within subject variance is the same, but clearly when you have the model separate this way, um, be easy to estimate this separately for each person. But for now, we're going to assume it's the same. That's what stage one now looks like. Stage two, what we're doing is we're replacing the betas with beta hats. If you ever replace something that didn't have a hat with something that does have a hat, in other words, you're assuming something that uh, you previously uh, assumed was known, now you're putting an estimate in place of it, you have to be careful. You can't just carry on. Um, you have to incorporate the variance of your estimates in some way. So that's why over here my ADAs have stars on them because I have to address the fact that these are estimates by putting in, ad ad adding to the ADA, the variances that uh, are being contributed from these estimates. So that's what we have over here. We have a within subject variance component, which is this sigma squared within, divided by W. W is the number of hairs, so in this example it would be 20. So this should look familiar because this exact equation was what we used in the hair example, example before. And then we add the between subject variance to it. So this is basically what we do. We estimate a model for each subject individually. We get an estimate for the within subject variance. And then at the second stage, we assume we know these betas by plugging in the beta hats, but since we know we're, we put an estimate in place of something that was previously assumed to be known, we will address that with this additional variance term, this within subject variance term. So just to break that down again, the first step, we estimate the mean of each distribution as indicated by these little asterisks. And then we estimate the within subject variances of the distribution. Um, for this cartoon example, we're assuming it's the same for all subjects. At the second stage, we estimate a between subject variance. So this is not as straightforward as I'm making it look here, but it's related to the variance between the means. So this yellow, red, oh, these were supposed to be aligned. They got shifted um, in blue. So it's related to the variance between um, the means the within subject means, and we get a between subject variance. So to this green chunk, remember the between subject variance typically dominates, we are gonna add this little gray chunk here. Why is it so small? It was big and now it's small because we have 20 hairs. So I take this, divide it by 20, and that's added on. So this is illustrating how the between subject variance dominates our overall population distribution. And you can see that if we add more hairs, 
All it's doing is shrinking this little chunk over here, which is already pretty small. Okay, and then we get the population distribution. The mean is the average of the uh, individual means. And then we have what we need to carry out our inferences. Um, here's what the statistic looks like. I wouldn't, this is not important. Um, yeah, let's just skip it. So make sure you understand that. Um, do you understand the cheat we used for the mixed model? Basically the two-stage summary statistics approach. And is it identical to the full mixed model? And if not, what's slightly different here? All right, thank you very much. Uh, next time I'll just quickly be going over how we do this with our imaging data. Have a wonderful day.